Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest. We're coming to you live on location from the Renault Winery. Welcome to the show, Josh McAllen. It is a great honor to have you here, brother. It's so great to be here. We've been, you know, we've got to know each other. We've met all over the country. 12, 15 times. <laughs> all over the country. And this is our first live visit to Renault. And wow, I, I just wow. What an amazing place. Thank you. You know, I saw the photographs, but it's, you can't experience it unless you actually physically come here. Take us through, it's gone through so much of, of a, I'll, I'll describe it as a metamorphosis from what it was to what it is now. And it's still on its journey to what it will be. You started out, I remember when we first met, you said, boy, if I could take over this property and do 60 weddings a year, I can carry it. That would have been true at that time. At that time. And you have blown past that, like add a couple of zeros and you, yep. you are just off to the races. Tell us a little bit about the journey. Well, this is, um, first of all, you and I have done your show three times, I think it is, and it's an honor to do this with you. And so if anybody knows us from those, you're going to hear some, you know, changes, you know, changes in my voice and our, the, the, the wisdom of hard work, right? Yeah. So uh, originally we were trying for a minimalist business plan. And of course, to a lot of people, it seemed like a radical business plan. If we could go from 60 to 100 weddings, that would carry the balance of revenue that we needed for a typical overhead and debt. Yeah. So maybe to back up, the property has an 18-hole golf I, course. I could tell you, yep. 56-room hotel, if I remember, and a winery. And it was in receivership. Nobody wanted right. it because it was too many disparate things mixed together that nobody figured out. Nobody could figure out what to do with. Uh, sorry for the backstory. You're exactly right. Uh, 158 years continuously open in various metamorphosis uh, evolutions. But by the time we got here, the family who had had it did lose it. It was still operating though. The, like you said, the bank kept it open. Yeah. It was on life support and we bought it I would say one quarter of its replacement value, but it was it was barely worth one quarter of its replacement value. It was in terrible need of a new vision. Absolutely. And so now you have basically taken something that is obviously over the last couple of years in incredibly high demand, event space for weddings. I mean, if you want to hold a wedding in the New York area, you're looking at several hundred dollars a plate for a windowless ballroom. Maybe you drive three hours out to the Hamptons, and here you are, an hour and a half, two hours from New York City, with an amazing space That's and, right. and the ability to host very, very large events that can really scale. That's right. And for those of you listening, you're probably like, but Victor, hospitality is so hard and dangerous. Well, this is the sweet spot in hospitality, where we get to have good price points. We can drive and maintain our margins. Because we do lifestyle catered events, which is of course backboned by weddings and because the American wedding contract is 18 months on average we really can almost see through a horizon of a downturn we can see into the future and build business plans monthly to be solvent so the the, the secret I think I answered the question but the property has so much scale 150,000 square feet of covered space and over 240 acres that we've designed concepts that allow multiple events to happen at the same time. So Jenny's wedding, Sally's wedding, and Lucy's wedding, they're all happening at the exact same time without them really interrupting each other. We stagger it. We have a whole science to it now. But the real magic isn't so much that we love weddings, I think, and you'll see it, Victor. It's that there's this crescendo, this waterfalling effect of revenue. Mm. Now, you know, we made this podcast years ago. I called it Capital Hacking, and, and I kind of meant you can achieve more than one goal with each effort or capital if you intend to achieve more than one goal, and we do, we try to knock down more than one domino, weddings knocks down multiple. It fills the hotel for 18 months in the future. It sells out our cafe restaurant and our, re our regular restaurant because people arrive a day early. They, they want to they have fun that day. And of course, golf. I would say that one was our lucky one. <laughs> we thought golf should pay its own bills, and now it produces 30 to 40% gross profit to us. Wow. It pays its bills. It is a major source of pride. And it's not a membership course. Premium public, they call it. I call it premium public. So you cost a good bit, but you and I can walk on the course today if there's a tea time available. Fabulous. 
What was striking, the thing I didn't expect when I toured the property with you is the number of spaces, the number of vintage spaces, the hallway that started out as kind of a crappy hallway turned into a gallery through a lucky accident, all of a sudden realized it could be a revenue space. Tell us about that. You you know, in private investing, as you know, you usually need to, you and I do this, we, 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 we help give a vision to things. It's the people behind the project often uh, and the people you surround yourself that can make things succeed or fail. This was supposed to be a corridor with art, a gallery, we called it. And then accidentally, uh, so many spaces got booked. A month out, they said, we're overbooked. And they, they talked one person into using it as a dining room. And it got photographed, got on Instagram, and it became one of the most high-demand pre-function spaces or night before parties and so for 30 40 people and it's a hallway victor you and i thought of it as a hallway and when we invested in it we're like well we have to have a hallway yeah okay we didn't think it could sell thirty thousand dollar events on friday nights uh pretty regularly (laughs) that's great revenue per square foot for a hallway absolutely so talk us a little bit about the winery the winery has a lot of history Sparkling wines, yes. some still wines yes, as well. Right. So this this is um, for those of you who are um, history buffs. If you start looking up uh, the Renault Winery name, you'll see stories that go back to the eighteen hundreds. You'll see uh, campaigns with Johnny Carson as our spokesperson in the sixties when he was a young dude, and you have this continuous operating business for one hundred fifty eight years. It had its. I always say, if if the Great Depression didn't kill it, and the and the Great uh, Prohibition didn't kill it. And then the pandemic didn't kill it. This thing's going to make it. And so we became, I, I would say that at some point over the last four years of living and working this, we've learned to call it a legacy asset investment strategy, not a flip. Right. And you know, clearly we're here to be perpetual owners as a group of investors and to benefit from generational cash flow. Well, and I wouldn't say you're just investors, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. You are hands-on operators. I mean, you are thinking through a lot of attention to detail, looking at what you can do with each space, what can we derive for revenue, what can you do during the pandemic to bring people on property when you couldn't do anything else. Talk a little bit about the Vintner Wonderland. Yeah, we did a, the Winemaker Wonderland, you know. Uh, Vin, I mean, Victor, you're, you're talking about my favorite topic. Yeah. So if anybody's listening, you can probably hear I'm uh, giddy. But in the pandemic, you know, the law, the law was you couldn't go in the doors. Right. But you could do stuff outside on the lawn. So we, we've started to slowly design the lawn to become more of a fire pit rich experience with little pathways and gardens. And then the cold started because we're in the north of America. So now all of a sudden it started getting cold. And our team was like, we don't want to stop working. You know, there's some people that want to sit at home. And then there's some people that actually feel joy of work, you know. Yeah. And we try to surround ourselves with those people who love to work. So... We came up with the village concept to be outside, and we said vintner, meaning winemaker. Uh, it's another method, another language, another uh, vocabulary word for winemaker, and we meant vintner wonderland, and we tried to tie it all toge- together with wine and ice skating and advent markets in Europe, and and we said, well, this is the season when the magic happens in the barrel and in the vat. Right. You know, we the, the grapes have done their, their, the vine has done its job. It has given to the grape. Now the grape goes into the hands of a winemaker. And magic happens, the alchemy. So we said, it really is magical. Why don't we make a whole village that celebrates it with ice and fire and outdoor fun? And it, and that's another magical space that you literally created out of nothing. That's right. It's a park. It's basically a gravel parking lot, but not anymore. But not it's anymore. a little better than that now. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you've got sofas, heated space. Uh, all of these fire pits, I mean, it's a bit of a gray, rainy day here. There weren't that many people sitting around the fire, but I can see on a weekend. Oh, it's packed. It's packed. Absolutely. It's, packed. it's so fun, guys. And then the kids have fun. And the mama, I always say, what better place to take the kids for an ice skating day than a place with great wine, champagne? Now, you asked me a little bit about the story. So this, this winery has a couple intellectual property rights. Mm-hmm. That someday, guys like you and I, Victor, are going to meet lawyers that are intellectual property lawyers, and they're going to help us. Because we have intellectual rights on titles of wine that is very rare. They're, they're usually protected by geography. Right. Like Champagne. Has to be the Champagne region. Usually it has to be. It almost always has to be the Champagne region, except for a few international uh, loopholes or grandfathering rights, and we're one of them. There's a, a few in Russia, I think, as well. If you Google it, I believe there's 10 international loopholes, and we're one of them. And, and it just means that we uh, predated the 
I think it's the Treaty of Paris, right? Where the the in in Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles, where the French asked the Americans to stop using the name Champagne. We predate all that after the First World War, and we were one that never stopped the label in sale in production. So that continuity of 158 years, I guess, is part of the story, and that's why we will not stop that continuity. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, Josh, so wonderful to spend time with you here to finally see the Renault Winery in person and see what you've done to transform it. One of the things I'm struck by is the pragmatism. It's almost like you are changing the tire on the car while it's driving down the road. And, and, and is that a good thing? Or no, bad? it's a, it's it's a great thing because you're bootstrapping, but still delivering a product that feels finished every step of the way. So you're not delivering something that feels thrown together, but you are still taking that evolutionary approach. And it's really quite striking what you've done with that, recognizing that this is going to be an evolutionary process. It is. It is. D- tell us a little bit about how you manage that because that that's unique. I'll give you an example of what Victor's talking about. So uh, with this 150,000 square feet, there's certain spaces that were primarily built to sell space and be revenue drivers. So a lot of energy in the first few years was on them. Uh, Almost 100% of the energy went into that 50% of the building, let's say. The other 50% just had to wait its turn. (laughs) I mean, it's like building a cathedral for 100 years, I guess, like they do. Isn't the one... uh, Sagrada Familia. It's still being built, Barcelona, yeah. It's a little like that, you know. So the ballrooms that had to sell, that they they got online first, then restaurants, then outdoor space because of because of the COVID, and then we came back in and we did a French cafe. We did uh, all these nice things, but we can't we can't let the the we have to keep the revenue train going. Yeah. So do do I wish we could snap our fingers tomorrow and finish all these great spaces that will also produce money, but they're lower on that f- waterfall. Right, the top of the waterfall is the wedding. It fills the hotel. It fills the catered, the other spaces. But there's all kinds of wonderful development coming. And uh, recently, our investors and I spoke, and we we've we've kind of identified what we're doing. So we're calling it legacy asset investing, where we we're broadening our horizon. And one other unique thing I think that people, some people are going to love about this, is we're keeping capital in the project mm. for longer, not because we. Uh, no other reason other than wisdom. I mean, not that we're perfect, but we, we're we growing in wisdom that our operational growth is in the double to 20 plus digits a year, 20% plus a year, which does create new challenges. Like I showed you those kitchens. Yeah. Did, I, did I ever think I'd need five commercial kitchens at first? No. But when you succeed at you catching the tiger, the tiger has to be fed. Yeah. And, and these are full on commercial kitchens. I mean, they're absolutely well equipped. Uh, top of the line equipment. I mean, we've started to learn about kitchens and how they're put together, and and you've had clearly good quality kitchen consultants design these kitchens for you. There's there's no question. When you're producing, I mean, think of a Saturday, right? For those of you out there, the scale is at least two thousand meals on a Saturday is pretty typical. Everything from a food truck we own to a casual restaurant to a cafe restaurant to multiple hundreds at the at a fine dining dinner and a re- and a wedding. So that scale is not a joke. And, and so that's why we invest in good people. Um, and we do, we do, I mean, that's the last thing most people ask me is, well, what about the people? And, and you have to make that the core of the business. Right. If you make that the core of the business and you're, you're going to work on investing in the people in whatever way that means, training, relationships, treating them fair wages, all the good things you need for longevity. You know, this is not a, uh, not a fly-by-night. Everyone in the food and beverage and hospitality space that I speak with has talked about and lamented about the difficulty in hiring staff. Can you talk a little bit about that? There was a few months this year where people were telling me we're 5 to 10% below what they'd like. Now, I would say pretty quickly, we I, I almost worry between you and me, I worried that we went a little 5% high. Okay. And I think it was out of anxiety. But the reason we were ever never, never, uh, what I'm proud of our team is we never had one of those things where you had a sign in your beautiful restaurant that said section closed, no staff. Right. We never had that once. So that means we never got to that kind of critical issue. And right now we're at, like I said, above probably full capacity of staff. And you know, Victor, you've heard me before, that we do work on uh, a, a culture that is, is personal and, and uh, it's demanding. I mean, we work hard here, but uh, it is very intentionally 
uh, we try to pour into the teammates and the teammates do the training and we train every week on how to serve guests with kindness and love and how to treat each other with the dignity we deserve. So that that kind of, we can unleash a certain human power to be good to each other. And I'm not saying anybody's perfect, but at least it's a positive culture momentum instead of a harsh. Yeah, we've experienced that here today very clearly. Lily, yeah. Lily took good care of yeah, you, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Josh, if folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? So uh, if you're visiting this area and outside of New York City, you might want to come to Renault Winery Resort. Just go to RenaultWinery.com. If you'd love to meet me, I'm on AccountableEquity.com, which is two words, AccountableEquity.com. Fabulous. Well, Josh, so great to spend the day with you. For listeners at home, definitely connect with Josh McCallan at the Renault Winery, RenaultWinery.com or accountableequity.com. And in the meantime, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. I'll talk to you again tomorrow.